Okay, everybody, welcome, welcome to another Creative University session. It's Peter Chadi, Creative University's chairman, co-founder with my wife, Louisa, who's probably observing right now as well. And my two kids, Hunter and Luca, who are actively involved and helped us found this thing. So today will be um, a session, an interactive session. And I'm happy to have some people from, let's see, Laura from Jordan is joining this time. Omri from Israel is joining this time, in addition to several who joined from the UK and Canada. So it's great to have you here because Creative University is for everybody, no matter where you are, to give you a peek into the wide, wide world of media and entertainment and tech. And today it's going to be a session where I go through my annual 10 prediction for media and entertainment and tech for the new year, for obviously for 2021. Um, as you can see, I'm wearing my Big Ten sweatshirt from the beloved University of Minnesota Golden Gophers where I graduated. And the song that I was playing, two songs. There was a song initially before we started by The Offspring, uh, which is a great band from Orange County from largely the 90s called The Future Is Now. And then Timbuk3, Timbuk3, The Future So Bright, I Gotta Wear Shades. That's from the same era. Small uh, little anecdote there. I saw Timbuk3 at the world famous Milky Way milk bag in Amsterdam back in the day. So how about that? And I went backstage and harassed the band a little bit. So that's a little background there, but I'm gonna get into uh, my predictions right off the bat. I want you to ask questions. This is meant to be interactive. So ask questions, chat them in, Q and A them. Um, and I have a special guest today, Parker Fife. Parker, join me. Parker is from USC, and he is a, hey Parker, good to see you. Unmute yourself, my friend. How's there it going? You go. Hey Parker, how are you doing? Great, can't complain. Okay, excellent. Where are you zooming in from? I'm in LA right now. Okay, outstanding. So Parker goes to USC. Um, he is a part of Creative University and we're thrilled to have him. And so I asked Parker to join us um, on this so that he can be another fresh face uh, in, on this and also ask questions, make it a little interactive and also take questions from you that he can then ask me. So don't be shy, don't hesitate. Next Creative University session, as you can see here, we're gonna have a special one to kick off the new year. The next one's gonna be January 12th, 11 a.m. Pacific. And it's with Perry Bashkoff, who's the head of music for Instagram. So that will be interesting. Where is Instagram going with music? Where's the future of music? We'll talk about all of that in addition to how he got from where he went to school to where he is today in a really cool gig. Okay, so with that, drum roll, please. Let's get into top predictions for Media Tech in 2021. And um, again, feel free to ask questions. That's what I want. Number 10, and I'm gonna go pretty rapid fire, guys. Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence will keep on going and accelerate, accelerating in its pace into uh, impacting our lives in a very significant way. So many ways this is happening. I was just on Alexa right now um, playing the music and obviously that's through AI. Um, and more and more we're gonna have our voice uh, assistants who are playing our favorite music and doing other wonderful tasks for us and probably listening into everything we do. So that's why my wife comes into my office and unplugs Alexa because doesn't want some of my top secrets to get out there into the world. So there is that, but I wanna mention a couple things. So on the, on the side that to really be wary of, obviously Google and Facebook collecting all the kinds of data, personal data um, in terms of fueling what they do not to mention TikTok, by the way, and TikTok found itself in the crosshairs of geopolitics this year, as we all know. And so it show, goes to show you that a favorite teen 20-something app that seems innocuous is fueled by one of the most sophisticated AI systems and algorithms out there. And that's what makes it so fun, so exciting. And so like, how did they come up with that video that they knew I would love? It's all because of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence still in its relatively early innings already transforming our lives in a very significant way. These are just some examples. So does anybody have any questions about AI and where it's going? Hearing none, I'm gonna move on to drum roll, please. Perry, 
Do you have any thoughts? Or excuse me, Parker, do you have any thoughts about AI? Um, I just want to get your prediction on what you think would be like TikTok's next possible move to help keep that relevant with the algorithms, algorithms they use. Do you foresee it being something like Vine where it kind of like hits a wall and it eventually shuts down because there's only so much they can do with that? What makes TikTok different in your eyes if it if you think it's going to keep being as successful as it is? Well, my understanding about TikTok's algorithms and AI, it's that it's fueled by the fact that literally everything in videos is tagged. It's tagged. So like what you're wearing, um, how, how, which videos you skip, obviously, how, how long you watch a video, um, what kind of video, and it's just tag after tag after tag. And so my understanding is that TikTok is so ahead of the curve in terms of just that kind of logistical um, work required to fuel the system that gets smarter and smarter each time that it's not insurmountable, but I don't think anybody expects it TikTok to hit a wall anytime soon unless geopolitics makes it so. And uh, I think that under the new Biden administration, it'll be interesting to see what happens there because the Trump administration certainly made a lot of um, uh, loud noises about it, but then dro just completely dropped it. Okay, good question. We'll go on uh, to number nine, number nine, games and esports. I'm sure all of you guys out there in Creative University land are, or at least many of you are big time gamers and know about uh, esports, which is watching others play games. And that's not only online and on Twitch and other platforms, but also in stadiums when we could be in stadiums. And so you'd have um, you know, the big tournaments that would be uh, the global tournaments would be in large 15,000, 20,000 stadiums packed to the gills. So games and esports, massive, so much more massive than most people in traditional media think. So the global uh, motion picture business is something like, don't quote me on this, but it's it's significantly less than $100 million, $100 billion. Um, and then the, mu the global music industry just crossed about $20 billion this past year and not including live music. And the games market is more than triple that uh, on a global basis. So game, the games market is massive. And it's and again, for many in traditional media, it is something that is not fully appreciated, uh, should be appreciated. And some of the things that are really unique to games um, not only the fact that it's relate, they're relatable and so they're the new sports and really impacting all traditional sports. Only the NFL has more viewership in terms of American uh, uh, sports leagues. So only the NFL. Uh, I think that it's that esports is is overtaking Major League Baseball this year or actually the NBA this year. So that's how big it is. And now there's betting coming in. But the big takeaway for other sectors of the media and entertainment business is the game's free to play business model, free to play. So it doesn't cost you anything to go in and play these games, but then you have your digital products that you buy because you're in the moment. So you'll buy that sword, you'll buy that shield. They already have your credit card information, bam. 99 cents doesn't seem like much, but it adds up to a massive amount expect some of that to be entering into as it should into the music business to grow that even further. So I think the smart players out there should really take a look at the game sector and esports, and that it's a real deal and real sponsorship dollars are going into it. Okay. And I'm going to ask Parker again, any thoughts on games and esports? Are you a gamer? Um, I personally am not, but I have two younger brothers who are super big on gaming and I've definitely just even seen from our home life, the exponential use in games and how frequently on there. So I definitely echo your thoughts on the popularity of it and how they've really just had the best time this year, you know, like they could possibly have with everyone being at home locked down. So definitely feel the same way. Definitely a great point that the, the home quarantine and lockdown has 
further accelerated how big the growth has been in the games and esports market. And 5G, obviously, the onslaught of 5G is going to do that even more because now you're going to be able to stream uh, and have that with no latency and have gameplay all around the world and just streaming without a platform. Okay, next, drum roll. So this is number eight. Virtual production, because what we're doing right now, the pandemic has, and this is a big theme. A lot of these trends were already happening that I'm talking about, but the global pandemic and our quarantine and lockdown has really accelerated certain trends. One of them is that virtual production. So what we're doing, uh, Parker and I, we're, we're seeing each other, we're live streaming each other. Of course that was happening beforehand, but certainly not like it is today where this is what we do because we have no choice to do it. Well, that has impacted not only our communications and how I reach you and the fact that we can even de do creative university like this, but certainly in terms of big time production for video and for other forms of media, now real remote production has taken a big leap because people are more comfortable with it. That can happen on a global scale and and this is important, now you have money flowing into the space for investment into these companies that are transforming uh, uh, in, in, and really enhancing the Zoom experience to be much more than that and bringing in productivity tools, not only from a personal perspective, from a business perspective to create together, to edit. Uh, and, and so expect that, that's a big change. And another thing, another thing when it comes to virtual, Certainly virtual when it comes to digital humans. And I have a picture of Carrie Fisher here. Carrie Fisher, if you remember, she was Princess Leia in the original Star Wars movies. Well, in the last um, trilogy, she was of course Princess Leia again, um, but she was much older. And then sadly she passed away. I think it was after the first one of the last trilogy, but not surprisingly, she was resurrected in digital form where few could really tell the difference because of how far digital and digital humans had, had come. And so she was able to star in the picture, her, at least her, her, her overall uh, image, her likeness. And we're just at the beginnings of that. So the efficiencies in being able to do digital uh, humans and, and creating people in that kind of fashion and characters in that fashion. Imagine that what that will mean for Hollywood in the future. Imagine that. So if you have, let's say, um, Tom, Tom Cruise, I only mention him because of Minority Report and Minority Report with screens changing and all that. That's also a peek into the window of the world. But let's say you're Tom Cruise. Mission Impossible, the next one, but yeah, you're, you don't feel like making those big jumps and leaps anymore. Well, ultimately, they're going to be able to take his scanned digital form and recreate a film in a, in an, a completely virtual environment, completely virtual Tom Cruise, and he's collecting his paychecks while he's sitting on the beach sipping um, his favorite margarita. So that is something that, is, that will be happening. What will that mean to Hollywood? What will that mean to the entertainment business? Uh, certainly gonna be disruptive. It is, so lots changing. Parker, any thoughts on that? Um, we actually have a question from Kurt that's kind of specific to Creative University. He's wondering with regards to this prediction, when it comes um, time that the pandemic is ceasing more and it becomes more manageable, do you see specifically to Creative University this moving into an in-person classroom setting for presentations and events? Or do you foresee keeping the online Zoom setting because it's so much more feasible now? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, great question. I'm a huge live guy. I'm a huge real world guy. So I'm best known for being like digital media, media tech. Um, I think there's a lot of downsides to that and nothing, nothing beats the being next to each other in the same room you know, pressing the flesh, doing all that. I, there's just some magic to that. The humanity of that will never go away. And I think there will be a counter reaction to all this virtual I, where people will certainly post pandemic, people are gonna wanna get out of their homes. So Kurt, great question. I would love to do it. Absolutely, I would love to do it. Who knows where Creative University is gonna go from here? Um, because it's for you guys. 
And so if there was sufficient demand for it, of course, I'd try to find a way. The problem is that virtual does enable me to reach people like Lara and Jordan and Omri in Israel. And that's, that's challenging if it's purely physical. But I love doing what I love doing this. I love engaging with you guys and trying to help you guys. And hopefully some of the insights are interesting. So being a professor to me is something that I certainly haven't ruled out. Okay, good question. Thank you, Kurt. Next, this is number seven. Number seven. Okay, so this is an interesting one. Obviously virtual engagement allows artists to create new forms of, um, New, entirely new forms of entertainment, entirely new forms to, to engage with and entertain their fans. And I have two examples here. So, and, and the important part of this is not only that they're new experiences, is that in some interesting ways, you have the, the like the technology enables an even more authentic experience, one-to-one -one experience in a very interesting counterintuitive way. So, um, and then, Importantly, it also gives artists an ability to what I would say scale themselves. So rather than having to travel from Los Angeles to San Diego to the next city, they can sit in their living rooms and do a number of things um, and just continue to bang out cameo messages as an example. So in cameo, which I'm sure many of you know, if you haven't, you should check it out. You can reach out to your favorite um, celeb or influencer and have them for a payment, and each one has their own price, for a payment to create a personalized message that you ask them to create. So if you want to send a birthday, birthday message from Cody Co., one of our favorites in this family, Real Bros, Bros of Simi Valley, a favorite show. Um, so if you want a message from Cody Co., then you pay some money, he'll send the message. Although we tried that. And it was, there was supposed to be a birthday message in this household. We reached out to Cody and he didn't respond. Cody, disappointing, disappointing. But the promise of it is that, and so he can now sit back in his apartment and respond and collect lots of checks all in one day. So he needs a little money. Well, okay, spends an hour banging out 10 second messages, 20 second messages, hopefully it's there's some thought put into it. So that's an example of new technology, new ways to engage. One-on-one -on -one is pretty interesting using technology and scaling themselves. Now on the left, you see Travis Scott, who of course shook the world with his Fortnite event and experience uh, a few months ago. Marshmallow, DJ Marshmallow did about a year before that. But Travis Scott's Fortnite event was seen by over 30, 40 million people and because of what he did, he was able to break his new song and it became number one immediately. So it was smashed. And more than that, he innovated. Big bucks are going to come into these things. So for all of, the, all of you out there who are thinking about like musicians and artists and how you break out, think creatively about all the different power and technology we're talking about and how it can transform or you can create new experiences. So any questions about that? Uh, and Parker, do you have any observations of, or anything that you saw was really cool this year? Yeah, um, kind of going off like the Travis Scott example with like, you know, the virtual like Fortnite concert. I feel like I've seen a lot of artists not only doing like live stream shows, but also like not necessarily pay-per-view concerts, but you purchase like a pass, like five, 10, $15 to watch this set that they've done that has, you know, high production. I think Dua Lipa did one in the past month or so. Um, and she was selling tickets for. And what I'm wondering is if this will continue when shows are back in person too. Will artists now start, you know, giving an option where, hey, you may not be in Los Angeles for the show, you might not be in New York, and, or you may not be able to go, you know, do like this $60, $70 ticket for the show, but I'm also going to be offering, you know, a $10 like ticket to the live stream, things like that. Um, and I'm wondering your thoughts on if you think that'll continue. Great question. So first of all, live streaming, absolutely. And it's going to get better and better. I watched this past weekend, Gorillaz. They had a live stream from the same company, actually. And it was amazing. It was great. It was, uh, I didn't feel like I was there. It was just a different experience. But to answer, and that answers your second question, 
live streaming has certainly been accelerated. That segment and that opportunity for artists has been accelerated because of the pandemic. It is here to stay, but it is not gonna be replaced. It will not be cannibalistic to the live experience. It will just be a new revenue stream, new ways for people around the world to see shows that they otherwise wouldn't see, to have a different kind of experience, just different and different cost structures. So same thing, I paid 15 bucks to watch. Um, another a great company that's doing these kind of things are really innovating in the live streaming space at high quality and for um, artists and festivals and events is a company called Bulldog Digital Media. I'm on the board of advisors because I, or excuse me, I'm on the board of directors because I believe so highly in it. John Petricelli and his team over there is doing amazing things. So you should check them out, bulldogdm.com. Okay, going to number six, live events. I love live events. I love music festivals. It's for my family and I, that's our, those are the, the greatest moments in our lives. Um, Coachella, Outside Lands, we went to um, Secret Solstice in Iceland up four years ago, and it was unbelievable. DJ set down in a glacier. Nothing beats that. Digital can't beat that. You can't have a DJ set down in a glacier. Well, you can, a virtual DJ set, but that's not the same. It was amazing. Live events absolutely destroyed. The entire out-of-home entertainment sector destroyed by COVID this year. Killed. Um, really sad. All the in-home players like streaming and games, they benefited from COVID and pandemic, like the Netflix of the world. Out of home entertainment, not so much. Will it come back? I think that live entertainment, live music festivals will come back bigger and better than ever before, but it's going to take time. It's going to take time. And it's going to take technology to get people feeling comfortable. So my prediction is that real events there may be some small ones in the first half of the year, but real events will only start happening in the second half of this year and really start kicking off again. I would imagine Coachella, the next Coachella is not gonna be in October of 2021, but we'll be back to being in April of 2022. So it will have been a two year hiatus um, actually. But technology is gonna be required to make people feel safe. First of all, vaccines, <clears throat> thankfully they're here. We will need to verify, <clears throat> and I have Ticketmaster here because they're focusing on a lot of this technology. Ticketmaster, through its partners, is going to is working on ways to confirm at the gate when you go into an event whether you have been vaccinated vaccinated or not, and whether you've tested negative accordingly. And you will not be able to enter unless you've tested negative within a certain window, 24 to 72 hours. That's what is. Is happening. That's what's being investigated right now. You can imagine there's a lot going on in the industry to do that. Then there's certainly going to be, th then you're in. Well, obviously sanitation is going to be very different at uh, live events, but a lot of things too are going to be better. So merchandise will be better, more efficient, food and beverage better and more efficient because you'll have touchless and cashless much more so than you did. Also, um, at all live events, including theme parks, technology is going to do a better job at crowd mitigation. So less congestion because you're going to have technology to um, delay, um, stagger times that you enter the site, you enter attractions, things like that. So that's what's going to be happening in live, live entertainment, live music, live, fe live festivals. And I can't wait. Um, any questions or Parker, any comments about that? Yeah, I actually talked about this exact thing in a music industry class of mine with one of our professors. He, at the end of the semester, kind of gave us a little bet where he was like, okay, like whoever can predict, you know, most accurately when festivals will be back, you know, on the market in full force, you know, I'll reach out in a year and a half and buy you tickets to them. So I said the same thing. I think personally that there'll be events back in the fall, but to be able to have a global festival like Coachella that has people flying in from all parts of the world and over a hundred thousand attendees, I again, don't think it'll be until the vaccine is readily available for anyone who wants access to it. Um, and we talked about the Ticketmaster thing too, which I'm honestly kind of excited for personally, just because I would feel a lot better going to, you know, an event of that scale, knowing that every person in there, you know, has been able to show their QR code, scan in, they're verified that they, you know, 
the they have the lowest chance possible of bringing in something that's contagious. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how it's received because I could see the potential of some people, you know, complaining about the hassle of it, having to you know, do that extra step, but really interesting stuff. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And Kurt makes a comment that doesn't see it happening until 2022 for the big events because vaccines take a long time to distribute, no question. And let's not forget when you're doing a major tour, let's say Beyonce is planning a major tour. It takes a year at least to plan it, build it, all that, design it. And then ultimately, obviously there's gonna be a glut. There's gonna be so many people coming out artists that are gonna try to find the venues and book venues and it's gonna be congestion. So how that all shakes out, it's gonna be challenging. But when it comes back, it's going to be the roaring 20s. There's such a pent up demand for this. And, you know, Parker, everybody wants, all you guys want to be outside again and you want to be together, right? You want to get off your screens and you want to be together. Even I want to do that. Like, I want, so it, it's going to come roaring back in a big, big way. Changed, but changed even for the better in many ways, I think. Yeah, okay. another thought, sorry, real quick, um, oh, yes. on the whole like planning aspect of the tours too, something I just thought of was the additional cost to become COVID compliant for large scale productions like that, especially, you know, like in entertainment, film, TV, any shows right now that are being produced is such a big additional step too that I think that could pose another obstacle that might push things to 2022, but yeah, yeah what you got to do. <laughs> no, great point. Okay, number five. Okay, this is a big one. Earth shattering in Hollywood. So theatrical windows have been shattered, shattered in 2020. And this is something that, so what a theatrical window is that movie theaters for decades have had the advantage of major feature films have first been required to be in theaters first and exclusively for a certain period of time. That's called the window, the exclusive period of window before they, the movies were released for the home and in other forms of distribution. That's a theatrical window. Over time, they have been, that window has been closing, 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 and it's been a huge battle with the movie theater business because it's having its challenges with all these other choices, streaming and everything, to stay viable and vibrant. So they wanna keep the exclusivity period. Meanwhile, the studios who create the content, they've been itching to test and see how it would work and how their movies would perform if they released those movies on the same day, what they call day and date into your homes as they are released into the theater. Well, this year, because we've all been locked in and we couldn't go into theaters and yet the studios had spent hundreds of millions of dollars in creating major feature films, they had a choice. The studios either could wait until things opened up again, which could be months, nobody knew, nobody knew, nobody still knows, or they could break the windows and do the, what was the almost thought of as unthinkable and release into the home for on, on day one first. So this year, under the guise of the great pandemic, Universal was amongst the, the major studio, was amongst the first to test these waters with Trolls World Tour. Trolls World Tour, that's why I have that image there. So Trolls World Tour was released, I think it was in June. And in the course of the first three weeks, it generated about $100 million in revenues, about $100 million in revenues. So the, the, the actual split economics between the content creator and the streaming service, so the studio and the streaming service are much more favorable direct to home. Something like 80% goes to the studio, 20% goes to the streaming service. And so on $100 million just in the first three weeks, Universal made about $80 million, about $80 million. Let's say 70 to 80, let's be a little conservative. Well, the first Trolls was released a few years back and of course theatrical. In domestic, so North American box office, the first Trolls generate about $150, $160 million but the splits, the economics are different. So there the studios gets overall, let's say let's about 60%, whereas the theater owners ultimately get about 40%. So if you take the 60% of that number and the 80% when it's direct to home, like Trolls World Tour was, you start getting about the same economics 
And then, of course, Trolls World Tour went on from there. So Trolls World Tour, the experiment worked. Now it didn't compete against any theatrical, so it's kind of apples and oranges, but it opened the window. That's the big story. Theatrical windows were shattered and just in the last two weeks, Warner Media, which is now part of AT&T, just announced that its entire slate of major motion pictures of its feature films, its entire slate for 2021 will be released day and date. So on day one, in your homes on HBO Max, on HBO Max. That was a cataclysmic announcement in Hollywood. That is massive news. And the biggest, most anticipated movie of the, of the holiday season is Wonder Woman 84. That's also gonna be released on HBO Max for Christmas, so directly in our homes first. So Warner Media is doing what was just a year ago thought of as absolutely blasphemy, the unthinkable, completely changing things. The genie is out of the bottle. It is here to stay. There's no going back. Theaters are gonna to have to evolve and be very different than what they've been because now you're gonna have these major feature films available to, to you at your homes. My prediction on top of that is that theaters will survive, but they're gonna to need to substantially um, reimagine themselves to be homes of greater experiences to more experiential, uh, creating experiences that you can't replicate at home. And I also think that young people, so teens and 20 somethings will never ditch the movies because it's a social experience, but the kind of movies they're gonna watch are the superhero franchise films. So the smaller indie adult oriented kind of movies will not find their way into the theaters, that, into theaters. They'll find your way on streaming services or they won't find you at all. That was something that was already happening pre-pandemic, but that trends certainly accelerated post-pandemic. Parker, any thoughts? Yeah, I think you're spot on. Like the, my first thought was we've kind of seen this coming a bit. We, um, I forget what year it was, but Roma was released on Netflix yep. and, you know, got nominated for just an absurd amount of Oscars. And I think that is around the time when we started seeing like that major shift to streaming services. And now there's just a plethora of options available for where you can subscribe. And I think it's kind of mirroring what happened with music when, you know, Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, when Jay-Z did that, um, opened everything up. And now we saw that major shift and record companies have had to grapple with that, readjust and kind of like see how they're going to have the revenue structure be um, post streaming. And so I think COVID might have just been the thing that blew it out of the water for film. So. Yeah, and there's a lot of angst in Hollywood because of it. So Christopher Nolan, one of the great directors out there in the movie Tenet, he is apoplectic about this because some of the great artists want to see their movies on the big screen, of course. Like a movie like that needs to be, needs to be, does it? Does, but needs to be on the big screen. Imagine if they're not on the big screen, just imagine economics because just really quickly, some of the big time artists out there actors, um, directors, they get what is called points, a percentage of the domestic or of theatrical box office revenues. And if the theatrical box office revenues aren't there, then their percentage, that deal that they had to do the film doesn't work. And so there's gonna be a lot of reimagining of economics in Hollywood. One more thing, here's another prediction that's associated with this. Remember Movie Pass, $9.99, where you could, for $99 a month, you could see unlimited films in theaters. My prediction is, yes, they died. That small little company died because the economics didn't work out. But guess what? Amazon and Netflix are going to come into this game. They're going to add another tier to your subscription possibilities for them. So for Amazon Prime, I think they may just toss it in, where they're going to buy some independent movie theaters who are struggling. And... They remember Amazon creates content. They're movie creators now, movie producers. Their talent wants to be in theaters too. Now Amazon has a chance to add yet another goodie to its prime membership, uh, get you into theaters they own, make their talent happy, get their films prioritized in there, more Academy Awards, and, and selling you more Amazon stuff, including Whole Foods, 
inside the theater. I mean, imagine that. That's cool. uh, prediction. Netflix too. Netflix needs to expand. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Generate more revenues. I think they're going to follow Amazon's lead and start getting into the physical real world a little bit. It makes sense for the same reasons for Netflix to buy some independent movie houses and do the same thing. Okay. Um, Den uh, yes, Natalie has a absolutely correct that uh, Dennis, I don't know how to pronounce the name, he is pissed. He only found out in the news about Dune, wasn't even told before the announcement. Imagine that. Okay. It's tough being a Hollywood executive, but you got to be, you got to have all the I's dotted and T's crossed. That is no way to treat artists. That's for sure. So good point, Natalie. Um, that's going to come back and bite Warner Media for sure. Okay. So number four, I kind of mentioned this. So this is the great, this is a massive transformation that's happening in media tech as well. Very big. Amazon, before Amazon Prime, was all about buying single transactions and hopefully buying a lot of them, finding ways to get us to buy and purchase, purchase, purchase. Now, the, the, the company was doing really well, of course. Then it introduced the genius of Amazon Prime, the genius of Amazon Prime. For, I think it's like $119 a, a year now, free deliveries, but $119 a year, rolling over year after year after year after year. When you have the customer base that Amazon does, it's all about Prime. They don't make, they barely make any money on the individual transactions. It's all about Prime. Changing from a single transactional model to a recurring revenue subscription-based model, which Wall Street loves, Wall Street loves. That's why you see Amazon is just killing it. And they went into, and they introduced Amazon Prime Video, not because they were looking to make money on Amazon Prime Video itself. In fact, because Amazon Prime Video is thrown into Amazon Prime memberships, they don't make any money just on that. But what they do do is they, Amazon uses Amazon Prime Video and Amazon Music to draw you in, to draw customers in, keep us there, added benefits, ongoing engagement. We're always thinking of Amazon if we're watching uh, Amazon Prime Video, if we're listening to Amazon Music Unlimited, and then we can ask Alexis, oh, you know, Alexis, oh, excuse me, Alexa, Alexa, uh, how about getting me this or that or the other thing because you're listening to music and you're jazzed and you know, motivated and all that. Amazon invented this, this massive shift from single transaction in the entertainment media business into recurring revenue subscriptions. And guess what? Apple mm -hmm. and Disney have now looked at what, what happened with Amazon Prime and, or Amazon and Amazon Prime vi Video and Apple, its big stealth gangster move this last year is really to focus more attention on Apple One subscription, which was really kind of news stuff and some games and almost like a throwaway before. Apple One subscriptions now have Apple TV Plus, Apple Music, and it's going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And you can imagine that in the in the not too distant future, you're going to be rather than buying your iPhones, you're going to be renting them over and over and over again. Predictable revenue streams, ongoing engagement with us as customers, not depending on us to come into stores every now and then or buying a Mac every now and then. Now, it's because of media using content as marketing to draw us in and to subscribe or get us to subscribe recurring revenues, our money, our pockets just continuously being pick, pickpocketed without us even really thinking about it because it doesn't sound that bad at you know, $14.99 or $19.99 or $39.99 when it's Apple. Well, guess what? Disney, yes, that Disney. So Disney um, slammed in its theme park business this year, which is something like 30% of their revenues, slammed, completely slammed because of the pandemic. Wall Street, so investors had slammed Disney because of that. So Disney stock had dropped significantly during the pandemic. So Disney did a really amazing thing. Obviously, they launched Disney Plus, the streaming service, about a year ago. 
Um, but it was lost in the noise, even though it was performing really well, lost in the noise of the pandemic and theme parks not doing well. So you know what the CEO of Disney did? Completely like as Wall Street was looking left at that story, well, deflected that and refocused them on a new story, streaming the, the, the part of their business that was that's killing it right now because we're locked in our homes watching Disney Plus and subscribing in record numbers. By the way, up to 86 million in one year's time paid subscribers. Netflix is at 175 million or 180. Uh, so still double, but that's over all these years. So Disney Plus, because of its refocusing on streaming first, Wall Street has looked at that story now and now Disney's at record highs. Disney's at record highs because they've transformed in the minds of investors and in our minds, they're now moving to a subscription service. And so for Disney Plus, Disney Plus video streaming is just the beginning. There will be more tiers coming in, paid tiers, where you'll be able to get discounts to theme parks once they open up, cruises if you really want to cruise again, um, but plush toys for your kids or for yourselves if you want, um, you know, a, a, a something, a, you know, a Disney princess or um, or whatever it may be, an Avenger. That's going to be thrown in too. And that will just be going on month by month by month. So Disney Plus is just the entry point to think about the Disney experience very differently. Any thoughts on that, anybody? Parker? Yeah, it's just mind boggling to think about how integrated these companies have become in our lives because things like Prime Video, um, their Whole Foods acquisition um, that Amazon did, these things are not like super old these were not happening you know before 2010 they were really recent but they feel like so long ago and so it's just crazy to think about how much is going to change you know in the post-pandemic world just from 2020 to 2030 I think there's just going to be so much exponential growth from these companies and how they just make their way into our lives even further so it'll be really interesting to see where they go with it. Yeah, I mean, listen, who, it's a great point, like Whole Foods. Think about the innovation that Amazon has had and just how they've just thought of things completely differently. So everybody's looking a certain way and then they go a different way. They buy Whole Foods, shopping malls are closing down. They open retail stores, which aren't performing now, but they will perform again. And it's because of like engaging with us in all aspects of our lives. So we're always thinking of their brand and we're always buying. Um, so it's, it's a fascinating thing that more and more companies are gonna are starting to think that way. So it's all about the recurring revenue bundle, a bundle of goods and adding to that and creating different tiers. So Natalie says, also Disney just announced a Moana TV series, Moana, Moana TV series and a car TV series. Nothing is done for them content wise unless it can be tied into merch or a theme park ride. So naturally they want to drive people to other modes of consumption of Disney products. Amen to that. The entry point for Disney's experience is now firmly Disney Plus. In fact, they restructured their company that way. And just like you said, the IP comes in, the content comes in, gets us hooked. Then we start going out into the theme parks to experience more deeply, all that stuff. Genius, genius. Okay, let's go to number three. All right, this is the big, the FANG companies. I don't know if you've ever heard of the FANG companies, F-A-A-N-G, but that's a big term of art of the, you know, the big scary Goliaths out there in media tech land. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google. Netflix is not so scary, and I'll talk about that later, but the other ones are scary. And certainly number three, because of how big they are, how massive they are, how, much, how woven in they are into our lives, and how others are frozen out, other players are frozen out to compete against them because they're so big. Well, number, the, number three is, it's the year of the great breakup. It's the year of the great antitrust movement, which has already begun. I predicted this. Uh, I created this deck and I wrote an article in Variety that was published last week uh, with my top 10 predictions. Uh, and I had written that about a month before. So it was pre 
feds going after Facebook, but now they have in the last couple of weeks, they've served indictments against Facebook, um, taking action and 40 attorneys, I think it's 40 states that are doing that. So they're going after Facebook. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy, Mark Zuckerberg. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Um, so that's happening. Amazon, Amazon too. The feds will take action against them. Amazon, Jeff Bezos, wouldn't surprise me if he took action first to, to take the, um, the, you know, the passion away from the feds to go after them. So Amazon, and will they split off AW, Amazon Web Services, which is a massive part of their business, which was also part of their innovation years ago. Everybody was wondering, renting out your infrastructure for other clouds or for other companies to use your cloud, huge part of their business. So that might be a natural um, breakup by the feds of Amazon itself and Amazon Web Services because it's so significant and everybody, all like so many companies are dependent on AWS. Apple, I think Apple is a little bit less in the crosshairs directly. Um, and Apple did a really smart thing. The big, one of the biggest complaints against Apple was that developers who sell their stuff on iTunes had to pay a 30% commission to Apple for that privilege to be able to sell on iTunes. It's a lot. So you know what Amazon or Apple did because of these rumblings of antitrust and breakups? So what Apple did was that they, in the last month, I think it was, they announced proactively, smart move, Tim Cook, proactively uh, to cut that commission from 30% to 15% for developers, I think making under a million dollars on their goods and services a year. I think that was the cutoff. Smart move, less threatening. The big guys still get the 30%, but there's less sympathy for the big guys. Let's face it. Um, net, so I think that they're not like Facebook number one, for sure. Amazon's in the number two-ish kind of land. Apple's, I think, safe for now because Tim Cook did the deflection. Netflix, Netflix is in a very different camp. Massive, massive, but Disney is catching up. I think ultimately Disney has the chance on a global scale to overtake Netflix in terms of paid subs. The growth is so fast um, and their global brand. But Netflix is only one revenue stream. It monetizes content only. We only pay our subscriptions. That's their only revenue stream. So as big as they are, there's a lot of competition. There's Disney Plus, there's Amazon Prime, there's HBO Max. I don't think Netflix is gonna be broken up. I think Netflix, by the way, ultimately will be bought because, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, Google, Google, YouTube, of course, um, making money off of our, um, our online behavior, our search, our identities, um, Google's scary in many ways. Um, certainly, um, the ways that algorithms are used to just continue to keep us watching certain kinds of videos and take us down rabbit holes, that's scary. They say they've addressed that. It's probably better than it was, but nonetheless, and Google and YouTube are just so massive. If Google's on a, a if Google search isn't a, a monopoly, I don't know what is. Now, there's the privacy thing. And Apple hasn't, hasn't announced, but the rumblings are that Apple's getting into search itself as part of Apple One, the subscription service. So what Apple's great pitch would be to us to get off Google and start using Apple search is that because it's part of Apple One and you're paying a subscription, they don't need to make money off advertising. So Apple search would be ad free, whereas Google ads selling our data, you know, making money off us, not palatable. Would you pay more to have an ad-free experience? So because of what Apple's doing, the rumblings out there, that might save Google from antitrust breakup because they're gonna be saying, well, others that are, are going to get in the game, we are vulnerable. I still think the most obvious thing, Google and YouTube split. Uh, so I think that's a real possibility. Parker, any thoughts? Yeah, something random I thought of. I just read this book called Everybody Lies, and it's about how you can use Google searches as a form of data itself. And basically, they've looked at what people are searching in certain areas, counties, cities, and you could use it to predict things like how the election will turn out, things like that. Um, 
how much voter turnout that will be based on like who's Googling where polling sites and things like that. And so if Apple is going into that search area too, I think it's really interesting to think about that not only will they be, you know, getting users on their search engine, but that also provides them with this new data set that they can then use to enhance like the sales of their products because they now have access to all of our individual thoughts on which products we want, which products we don't want. And it really gives them this newfound power if they, you know, use it correctly to just have every little insight into what our subconscious mind wants. <laughs> yeah. No question. Good. Very good points. Okay. Number two, we're getting to the top. Uh, so now this is, uh, expect some significant, what M&A is mergers and acquisitions means that bigger companies buying smaller companies or vulnerable companies. That's what M&A is. So in the media and entertainment and tech world, traditional media, so all the major studios, because of this this transformation of the business into streaming first and subscription first and people watching less cable TV and people watching less linear regular TV. There were there were major acquisitions. AT&T bought Time Warner, the Time Warner Studios a couple of years ago for I think it was eighty six billion dollars. Um, Comcast bought NBC Universal, Comcast, the cable company, bought NBC Universal many years ago. Forgot what the number was, but it's for the same reasons that all of these tech companies were buying the traditional media companies. Obviously, Fox was bought by Disney, a little bit different situation, but Disney is a different kind of company, media company. And so there was this major MA, mergers and acquisitions, buyouts. It took a pause in 2020, as I expected last year. I didn't think there was going to be major MA happening. But now that pandemic has happened and really accelerated certain trends in the business that we're talking about. I anticipate more and more actual um, significant acquisitions and sales. And here's a couple of them. And I predicted this about, uh, you know, as I said, I wrote my article first about a, a month ago. And since that time already, AT&T, which is one that I predicted, AT&T is having a very hard time with the acquisition so far of Time Warner and War which became Warner Media, which is a which is um, CNN, um, you know, the film business, um, and many other kinds of things. Uh, Turner, HBO, uh, and and so AT and T under pressure because its bread and butter is making money off our data our data. That's what it uses content for. So we buy more and more of its mobile plans, right? That's why they do it. So AT&T just recently announced the sale to Sony of Crunchyroll, anime focused Crunchyroll for over a billion dollars. So we're already getting to what I predicted happening. Don't be surprised if CNN is, yes, it was a huge year for CNN and for all live news channels because of the election. But now that the election is over, CNN may not have the, and the others may not have as much of a, you know, a push. It may not. So maybe a good time right now for AT&T to sell CNN. And it wouldn't surprise me if somebody like Amazon picked CNN up. Why Amazon? Well, listen, Amazon already does feature live content, live sports, NFL. And so it's, it, to me, it's a natural that news, live news, CNN being brought into the AT&T family. And don't forget, Jeff Bezos already is in the news business. He owns the Washington Post. So that's a prediction. I could also imagine Comcast shedding NBC Universal, and here's why. The entertainment media business is what they call a low margin business. Margin means the actual costs and the profit on top of the costs. Because of how expensive it is to produce content, the margin is actually pretty low in the media and entertainment business and not predictable because you can't necessarily predict hits. Well, guess what? With the streaming explosion that we've had, Comcast Cable is killing it. They're killing it because everybody wants faster and faster broadband, faster and faster broadband. That's a high margin business, very high margin business. So Comcast is actually doing just fine, even though NBC Universal is challenged. So expect some M&A in that kind of sense in the media and entertainment and tech space. I think that that's going to blow up quite a bit this year. Parker, 
Before we get to number one, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I also definitely see this just um, further conglomerating all like the streaming services too. back to when we were talking about, you know, how many different things you're paying for at any given moment. I think it'll be really interesting to see if any of these mergers and acquisitions lead to bundling and how, you know, maybe that'll shift how we go about subscribing to things. You know, if certain um, companies have, you know, an array of services that we can just, you know, provide for and pick certain ones versus having an extensive amount of separate ones. I think it'll be really cool to see, especially with the news too, like if that gets thrown into any of them. Um, yeah. Yeah. No question. Good stuff. And gets to number one. My number one prediction is that the world will open up. Hence the graphic. It will start opening up this year, really significantly in the second half of the year, once vaccine vaccinations are getting out there. So we'll start venturing into some live events, live experiences, thankfully for that entire sector of the business. Although 2022 is really going to see when it comes back in a significant way. So for much of the year, we're still going to be a nation and world of couch potatoes, watching our stream, hence that graphic, <laughs> and watching all of these streaming services that are benefiting from the fact that we need escapism and we need entertainment and we're locked in our homes and we're getting crazy. And so this is how we escape. That's how we stay sane. And now we have the great streaming wars happening where you have, I already talked about Netflix. I already talked about Amazon Prime. I talked about Disney Plus, how they're killing it. And HBO Max was just introduced earlier this year and has underperformed by all, by all accounts in the media and entertainment business so far. You have NBC Universal's Peacock that has come out, and then there's an endless supply of others, and that's really you know, just focusing on North America. Well, in the streaming wars, the great differentiator is content, so exclusive content. So that's why you saw Netflix had budgeted 16 to 17 billion dollars on on its content. Uh, for this year, but it couldn't produce it this year, but it's still those budgets, that's the size of the budgets. Um, now, ultimately, all these other guys, all the big players I talked about, AT&T uses HBO Max so that we buy more wireless plans. It uses content as marketing. Um, Disney, as I said, Disney uses Disney Plus as the entry point to sell all of its services. Apple, Apple uses Apple TV Plus as part of Apple One so that we ultimately buy all of its Macs, phones, high margin businesses. Amazon, Amazon uses Amazon Prime Video as marketing, not, to, not for the service itself, but as marketing so that we buy, 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 shop, 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 and buy Prime, you know, Amazon Prime. Netflix, not so lucky. So it has these massive content budgets because it has to keep pumping out fresh content all the time to keep us hooked, especially in this hyper competition. And it doesn't have any other revenue streams. So it sells content for content's sake while the others all use content as marketing. Totally different ball game, completely different ball game. Tremendous advantages from all the other Goliaths out there. So no matter how invincible people think Netflix is, I don't think, I never have thought that Netflix is invincible. And I, getting back to kind of slide, slide one sl and number two, I ultimately think because of those economics and those realities, and I think that Disney Plus will overtake uh, Netflix in the next couple of years in terms of overall global subscriptions because of its Disney brand and Star Wars, Pixar, Pixar movies, and all the others that it has, uh, the Disney princesses and Marvel, let's not forget, because of all that, I think that ultimately Netflix will be bought. And who are the likely buyers? I, I think that it wouldn't surprise me if Amazon and Apple come into the game. Don't forget, Apple had its own Apple Music subscription service. It didn't succeed. It was not doing well. So what did it do? What did it do? It came in and bought Beats Music and all of a sudden Apple Music is doing really, really well. So it bought its way into the game. Very small purchase comparatively, that was $3 billion. Uh, Netflix would be massively more than that. But nonetheless, 
Nothing is impossible. No one is invincible in this new world of media, entertainment, and tech. It's exciting. It's crazy. It's wild. It's fun. So much to see. It's a great business to be in. So many places to be part of it. And so those are my 10 predictions for the new year. And Parker, it's been a pleasure to have you. Do you have any parting shots before we go? No, it's been great. This was so much fun to listen to and get a contribute to. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure as always. Parker, you were great. You added a lot of great content and that was only on an hour's notice. I thought it would be kind of interesting to bring in a fresh voice and a, and a creative university college student coming in and giving that, that real world perspective. So thanks a lot for joining um, everybody. If you want to be part of Creative University, uh, don't forget that the next session is Perry Bashkoff, head of music for Instagram. That's gonna be a great one. Make sure you bring your questions and ask him. We all love Instagram. I mean, everybody uses Instagram. Uh, yes, even I. I'm an occasional user. And then if you want to learn more about Creative University, go to the Creative University website. You can also go to the Creative University YouTube channel because they're all the interviews that we've just had, all the sessions that we just have, they're all on demand, on video. There's great ones. You should check them out. You'll also be able to listen to all of them in podcast format on my new Fearless Media podcast. And so you can check that out on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts fearless media, listen to them. They're great interviews. And then I have my book, Viral Media, that I'm giving away free to anybody who wants it because I want you guys to have hope, inspiration, maybe some learning during these crazy times and ultimately some real world opportunities to break into the business because it's a great business. It's a great business. You'll love it. I love it. I haven't even had that much caffeine today, but I love it so much. So I know I'm talking a mile a minute. See you guys.